hold of, uh, of that. The Christian walk is like climbing a mountain. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those mountain climbers? They have all kinds of safety ropes. Mm -hmm. They have all kinds of nails and pins and hammers, and they take a step, and they put it in a pin, they lock themselves down, and then they move to the next step. They tie themselves off, they anchor themselves, and they, then they take one more, more step. Hey, they find a space, they anchor in, and then they tie off, and then they take another step. That's the way the Christian life ought to be. Some of us think it's running, because the, the, the mother climber knows it may take him three or four days to get to the summit, but one slip, he will be back at the bottom in seconds. And maybe not just that he arrived at the bottom, but he may not arrive alive. Hmm? And so he has to pay attention. See, and sometimes in our Christian world, we miss that. We fail to understand that the devil is not playing games for us. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion, doing what? Seeking whom he may have fun with? Devour. You know what that means, Sister Norma? Eating to just a skeleton left. The devil wants to destroy your life. On Sunday, if he could, Sister Norma, he wants the church to be talking about you. And not about how many souls you want, not about the great time you've had with your family, not about the great things you've done in the community, not the great stuff that you have done in the church and the singing the choir. He wants to have some kind of a gossip going on that Sister Norma has done something so ugly that she'll probably never show her face to the church again. That's what the devil wants to do. But not only Sister Norma, the devil wants to do that with all of our lives. See, it's easy for us to look and say, boy, he wants to destroy Brother Dunham. The truth is that he wants to destroy Brother Taylor equally as well. He wants to destroy all of us. And that's what he says, we must bring our bodies and keep our bodies under subjection. He says that every man that strives for a mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, right? uh, uh, but we are an incorruptible crown. He says, you know something, we're going to watch that game tonight. You listen to them talk, you listen to guys fight, curse, argue, you will see some of the greatest basketball players in action in the next couple of minutes. Some of these young men have been at it since they were six and seven years old. Two, three, four, sometimes five hours per day. They've honed their skill. They've honed their craft. They're good at what they do. They have put in the time. The Bible says they have worked diligently, but they've worked diligently for a an in, a, a corruptible crown. You said, Brother Taylor, I'd like to have a little of that corruptible crown. 200 mil. Huh? It's by hard and sign. Mm -hmm. Who is worth 200 mil for just... I guess it's worth it because I can't get the ball in no matter how hard I try. But listen to me very carefully. The Bible says they do it, but they do it for a corruptible crown. Now think about that. When, when we serve God and the things that we do, the Bible says we do that for an incorruptible crown. This would be Kevin. I mentioned some numbers that we can't fathom. If anybody in this room got about 200 mils, see me after the service. I don't want to ask you for a little bit. I want to know where you have it stashed so I can come get it. Hello! But listen to me very carefully. Huh? Because he says this is a, a incorruptible crown. I want you to understand that those numbers are no comparison to this crown. Making any sense? Anybody getting an idea that this crown that God wants us to work towards, this incorruptible crown, has some serious value? We don't work that hard because we don't put that much value on it. We don't recognize that this thing is worth more than anything that we can earn in this life. Yeah. If I could 
just get that across. I'm not good enough a teacher <coughs> to get that across to you, Sister Norma, that this crown that I'm talking about tonight is worth more than $200 million in cash. If I could do that, I could encourage some people of God to get busy working towards some crown. Wish I was a better teacher. The Bible says, now they didn't do it to obtain a, corrupt, a corruptible crown. He says, but we, an incorruptible crown. He says, I therefore so run. He says, win a race. All of us are running. He says, but runs to obtain. He says, dig, don't just come to dig. Come to be the best deacon that you could be. Not so that you could be receiving a reward from the church. Not so that folks in the church can like you. So that God could be pleased with every decision you make. And every decision you make is a godly decision. And every decision you make is a decision that God demands. God appreciates and likes. He says, therefore, so run. He says, run. He says, Sister Jacobs, you, you, you got the degree. You've been now uh, 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 approved to teach. He says, just don't teach. Don't just run. He says, teach the best teaching you can do. Hey, it means you're going to have to do some deep, deep diving. You're going to have to do some extra study. You're going to have to pay attention to the folks that come. You're going to have to be sensitive to the needs of the people, the hearers. Hey, you're going to have to probably eat a little bit of your pride. You're going to have to step up to the plate and put yourself in someone else's shoes. You're going to have to then, in your life, change yourself. Change your thinking. Change your behavior. Then you're going to have to get up and just say it. Sometimes they're going to accept it. Sometimes they're not. He says, just don't run. Prophecy said, if you're going to be the treasurer, don't just be the treasurer. Be the best treasurer that this church has ever had. Amen. Hey, Mr. Charles, if you're going to do those videos, I'll make Brother Taylor look the best you can make him look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen to me carefully. He says, do the best job that you could ever do. Just don't show up. Show up with prepared. Show up ready. Show up. Put something out that folks will look at and say, boy, that's something of quality. That guy is concerned about what he's doing. He says, don't just run. He said, all of us in the race, you can't get out of it, Sister Norma. But some people are there, they have no desire to win. Everybody can't win the race. No. But the kind of race that we're running is not a first, second, third, fourth race. Everyone has an individual race. We're all in this race together, but I'm not racing against Sister Jenkins. I'm racing against what God has gifted me and what God wants me to do with the gifts that he has provided. God says some of us are coming last in a one man's race. How could that happen? Hello? Hmm? Some folks have quit the race when there's only one person in it. Hmm? They're missing the mark. And that's what he's talking about. He says, so run. He says, not as uncertainty. Don't just do this thing flippantly. Just don't do it sometimes and not sometimes. Don't just show up not ready. Don't just show up when you feel like coming. Don't just show up uh, because folks were nice to you. Don't, not, just, don't quit coming because somebody said something that got a little bit under your skin. He says, don't do it with uncertainty. Understand that I'm working for God. God is keeping the record. He will reward me justly based on what I have done. We talked about it last week. He says, a just reward. Mm -hmm. You get exactly what you deserve. Mm -hmm. His grace and mercy might give us more. Because if God gave us exactly what we deserve, we would all be doing what? Burning in hell for all of an eternity. He says, so run, not as uncertainty. He says, so fight out. Hmm? 
talked about it last week. Paul put out some awesome fight. And he says, I, 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 he said, I got a problem with some believers that put out no fight whatsoever. I, I told you when I taught the last class that I hate uh, listen, watching some weak fights. Mm -hmm. Get knocked down. Get up. Knock the man down. Get knocked out again. Get back down. Get bloody. Give your corner man some work to do. But do something for the cause of Christ. Now listen to me carefully. That's what you got to do in the house of God. That's what you have to do in the ministry. And I'm not talking about fist of because some of us good at that. Hello? Every Sunday. Huh? We are on center stage with somebody. But we're talking about fighting the devil and fighting for what's right and fighting for God's purpose in our lives. He says, so fight I. Not as one that beat it there. Listen to me carefully. I don't care how good you look in shadow boxing. Hello? That shadow has never knocked you out. That mirror has never taken you down. You may cut your hand if you get a little bit too close, but don't get yourself too excited about how good you look when you shadow box. But Charles, you can beat anybody shadow boxing. You'll be dangerous. Yes, sir. <laughs> Every day, Brother Charles said. Mm -hmm. But when the next man stands in front of you, and you've got to get out and dodge, uh, and get on that little bicycle and backpedal side to side, you, it's a whole different ball game. And that's what Paul was talking about here. He says, in that race, don't get too arrogant about the fact that maybe, that maybe I, you know, I've got only little teenagers, so I, I, I got that much little bit knowledge over them. And so I, I don't have to read and study as much as if I'm teaching to a, a Bible college or I'm teaching some scholars. So I just bring my Bible, and I don't even open it, and I just stack up in front of them, and I just say any kind of stuff. Some people do it. No, it's not for Sunday, so I don't have to practice that hard for my song. Mm -hmm. That's not that many people going to be here, so I just do anything. No practice all week long, and then you come here and you're off key. Then you're angry because somebody said to you, what was that all about? <laughs> Sister Norma, I've never heard that key in my life. <laughs> Hello, you better hit that nose and do some practice. <laughs> Listen to me coming, he says, hey. He says, not as I'm saying, so, so, so fight I, not as one that beat it there. Paul says, but I keep under my body. Paul says, you've got to keep on top of it now. Not because you had a good day yesterday means you're going to have a good day today. Hello? Not because everything went well in your Christian walk yesterday means that everything is going to go well in your Christian walk today. And I, I remember, just, it was just last year. Sister Taylor goes for a regular physical. She goes for the medical, medical, regular physical. I don't know what day it was. Let's say it was Wednesday. Thursday morning, this, the doctor's office called and says, you need to come right away. She goes right away to the doctor's office. Immediately, they says to her, you should leave here and go to the hospital because we see something. We're concerned. So here it was on Wednesday morning, we're having a normal day, a normal life day. Everything is peaches and cream. Talking junk, going through the motions, just like, the, like we own the, the world. On Thursday afternoon, she's in a scrubs and she's in this gown that's open in the back. She's laid up in the bed at the hospital and I'm sitting in that chair and waiting for the doctor to come in. They're going to be doing this major surgery. And thank God, that's some smart doctors. Did the MRI. They said, Miss Taylor, we don't see nothing. We're not going to have to start. <laughs> Kept it overnight. The next month is home. And we're back to our food. <laughs> <laughs> but for that 24 hours, talk, uh, all right. we want some pins and some needles. Mm -hmm. Let's be careful. He said, but I, I bring another suggestion. So the point I made was, just because today was a good day, doesn't mean tomorrow is going to be a good day. Mm -hmm. you, you, might, you might get some news before this night ends that will change your life 
forever. Amen. Hello? Amen. He, says, I, he says, I bring it under subjection. Paul says, it's hard work, but he brings attention. He says, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I believe all of us, if we just think hard enough, can probably name a preacher, a teacher, a person of God somewhere that was doing a great work, and then you heard something about them that changed your whole opinion of them, and in some cases ministry, the people in ministry, and maybe even God himself. But I don't want to invite you to think that far out, Sister Norma, tonight. Just want you to think about your life. Every single one of us has something in our lives that could take us down today. If God decides that that's what he wants to focus the next 24 hours on. done something in our life at some time in our life that we're just not proud of. Paul says we better keep that under suggestion because just like we've done it before, out of the will of God, in a backslidden condition, we could find ourselves doing it again. Unfortunately, some folks know better when they're playing around with sin and they're presuming on God and they're expecting God to keep their sins covered and one day he's going to say enough is enough. Paul says, so when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Look at Brother Taylor, said, boy, he taught down here, yelling out of control, Tuesday after Tuesday after Tuesday, and there he is, look at him. He's no different from anybody else. It means I did like David. The Bible says when kings go to battle, David stayed at home. He was the king! He can determine a day off, did yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with taking the day off. He was the king. He had been fighting wars since he was a teenager. He was fighting battles and beating giants when he was just a kid. One day off didn't seem to be such a bad thing. Bible says what he did on that day off. See, David knew something, and he shouldn't have done what he did. Because David knew that the women in his day, in his time, when the men go to war and they go off to work, the ladies took their little bath on the porch. Yeah. Hello. So that day David knew exactly what he was doing. David says, I'm going to go to the porch. Hello. For a little time of relaxation. Hmm? He saw her. He knew exactly who she was. David knew that Bathsheba was Uriah's wife. Hmm? Hello? In other words, it says the sin that we commit lots of times, we know it's sin. Hello? Before we do it. David knew, who, David knew he shouldn't have been there. David knew that that was the man's wife. See, but I saw something. Hmm? And all of a sudden he says, Whoa! Send for her. Hmm? So you got somebody else involved. Send another person. Your sin doesn't just affect you. So he sends a servant and goes to, the, to, to Bathsheba's house and says, The king wants to see you. Now she probably never knew that David was peeping on her as she took a bath. She is probably coming to the kingdom, coming to the, the palace, shaking and trembling, thinking that what? Her husband was dead. So she's probably coming thinking, oh my God, the only reason David will call me into the throne room, 
something ugly has happened on the battlefield, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. Can't imagine what took place next. Because I can't but imagine that she was the kind that would just say, okay, that's what you want, that's what you get. But he was the king. There will be those that will tell you that David sinned and ugly sin and raped Uriah's wife and took her. But his sin didn't stay there. No, it did. Because the battle continued. The next day, David probably got up just like another, like his normal day, Sister Norma, took a shower, put on his armor, got on his horse, into his chariot, and headed out, and fought alongside Uriah like nothing happened. Sometimes we do the ugliest and the dirtiest of sin, and we just lick our mouths. conversation at lunch? What was he saying to Uriah? Probably saying the same old stuff, living as if nothing happened. A couple months went by. And she will notice something's going on. I'm missing something very important. Whoa. Uh, I got to check with the doctor. She's pregnant. She can count months. She knows her husband wasn't home. Couldn't be her husband. She knows that she was faithful and didn't run around with anybody else. She remembered, oh, David did something to me. Oh my God. I'm pregnant for the king. So now the king gets a message. Because she probably sent a servant to the king and said, I need to see you. <laughs> David probably took another day off. Now I'm reading into it now. Don't write this down as theology. Uh, hello. But David probably took another day off thinking, wow, she want to come back. <laughs> hello. Could you imagine what's racing through his mind? I don't want to go there tonight. Huh? But can you just think about that? Much of that mind, she, he thinks she's missing him now. She sent for him. Hello? But the chickens were about to come to Jerusalem because when she saw him, the message he got hmm, rocks his boat. She says, Dave, hey, I hate to tell you, I've got some bad news to give you, Jack. you got a baby on the way. And I don't know how you're going to deal with it, but you better talk to my husband, because he's probably going to kill you. David says, don't worry about this. I got this. I'm the king. See what I'm saying? Because now instead of God, he should have fallen on his face right there, or right then, before God. But he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Goes down that path, he decides, I am going to handle this. I'm trying to hide this from God. David is no better right now than Jonah is. Last time I was here, I talked to you about Jonah, and I said to you that Jonah forgot something about God, that God was omniscient. David forgot to look up. He forgot that no, his wives didn't see him with Bathsheba. No, the servants didn't see him with Bathsheba. No, Uriah didn't see him with Bathsheba. Nobody probably in the kingdom saw him with Bathsheba. Somebody saw him. Hello. And that somebody sees you and I. Hello. What have you done? What is your Bathsheba that God has seen? That you're covering up and you think that you can get away with it. One day, the man of God will tap on your door. So he decides, you know what, I'm going to fix this. So he gives the story. I'll call for Uriah. So now he sends a message to her husband. 
And he says, Uriah, take a couple of days off. Exactly what I did. Hmm? I want you to get into something that I got into. At your house. He says, Uriah, come on. Hey, take a few days off. Hmm? Go to enjoy your wife. Man, you are the best fighter we ever had. He forgot that there is a God. God said, uh, put it to your right side. I can't do it. I can't go enjoy my wife when all the other men are fighting. Now listen to me careful. That's some kind of guy. Because most men would say, forget the fight and let's get to work. <laughs> hey! But listen to me carefully. That's what happened. Let's get this guy. And your eye doesn't touch the woman, wouldn't go home. Hung out at David's house. He let his wife just down the street. David doesn't know what to do, so David gets another thought. Again, had another opportunity like Jonah had to talk to God, but he chose not to. He still thinks that he could cover it. What are we covering tonight? Hmm? So be careful now. He goes to, he decides, you know what? A little MD 2020. <laughs> mm, that gut rock stuff will get the job done. Hmm? I'll get him some of that. I'll get him liquor it up. And any man drunk as a coot will go home to his wife. <laughs> he won't know what happened. By the time he wake up in the morning, he'll be the father of a baby he had nothing to do with. Ryan goes home. Ryan decides. You know he doesn't go home. Even in his drunken stupor, the Bible says, he chooses not to go home. God is about to blow up David's sin. Wouldn't go home. Gets to the end of the leaf, he realized he's not going home. David has another plan. David said, I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write a letter to Joab. I know I can trust Joab. Every church has a Joab in it. That you want something dirty done, Y'all know exactly who to go to. <laughs> Hello. Let me ask the question here tonight on, on tape. Who is the Joab of the True Line Baptist Church? Don't answer that question. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. He, he, he sends the letter. And he writes the letter. And he seals the letter. And he gives the letter to Uriah. Thank God it was for some of us. Because some of us would have ripped that letter open, read that letter up and resealed it before we got to the battlefield. But he handed it to Uriah, Uriah, a faithful servant of David. He takes that letter, his own death orders. He gives it to Joab. The letter says to Joab, now Joab's probably wondering, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what David has done. He knew that Uriah is a good man and David liked him. And Uriah is a great fighter and there's won many battles with Uriah, but this letter confused him. And he gets to this space and he says, but what in the world? He's thinking, what could have Uriah done that would cause David to place this order? But he doesn't have a choice. He has to do it. The letter says, in the heat of battle, hmm? let Uriah charge to the front in the heat of battle. Oh, that's right. Uriah, Joab, pulls back. Uriah's killed. David doesn't know. Died not knowing that David impregnated his wife, but that's okay because who knew? Hello. You may be handled wrong. You may not know what's going on, but God knows. And as long as God knows, we say that he keeps the record. Too many of us, the Bible says, man can say what? Mine. God says, I will repay. But too many of us try to fight our own battles. It's a good thing that Uriah didn't know. Because the battle might have been a different kind of battle. Hey, something ugly might have happened in this kingdom. We don't know what that is, but we were spared that. But something ugly did happen. But it's because sin carries with it consequences. So Uriah goes, David. Get, and Joab sends the letter back. David says to him, when the deed is done, and Uriah is dead, send me word. He's probably now going to be 
have this big ceremony. He's going to then uh, marry Bathsheba. He's going to then, uh, the whole kingdom is going to say how great David is. Because in honor of his great warrior going down, he did the most honorable thing by taking his wife and making her his own. Because that was the loyal and royal thing to do. But he was covering up a sin that nobody in the kingdom knew about other than who? No, he knew. That she would do. The devil knew. Huh? And God knew. This is the Your sin is never alone. Mm. You know. The person you sin with knows. The devil knows. And God knows. Mm. Most of us are running around thinking nobody knows. I got this covered. <laughs> got this on the wrecks. This is under control. Mm. Uh, Trump is finding out a lot, huh? A lot of stuff's coming out that he thought, boy, he had locked down tight. But this is going to be careful. All of us think there are things in our lives that are locked down tight. That God, well, if it just takes one day, he can expose it. This is going to be careful. He marries Bathsheba. And everything's going on great. He's going down the path. She's getting bigger. He's probably rubbing the stomach. He's feeling the baby moving. And boy, the whole kingdom is excited that there's going to be a little royal baby on its way. Nobody else can figure the time because he moves so quickly when they figure this out that they would think that, boy, you know, hey, this baby is Urias, but David is treated as his own. This is something. Hmm? Yeah. God says, you know what, it's time now. So he sends the man of God. This will be careful now. Men of God know more than they say if they're real men. We see more than we talk about. If we're real men of God. That can we just get out and speak out and shut up. Doesn't mean that's everything that we know. Nope. So Nathan comes and knocks on David's door. And David began to feel again like he's something. Man, the man of God's about to pay me visit. So David decides we're going to have a giant feast. The man of God didn't want to eat. The man of God didn't want to do a whole lot of small talk, the man of God came with a, an agenda. He was sent by God to David to confront him about his sin. Now again, it's just between David and the man of God. The man of God came to David and the man of God gave David a small story. He said, David, he says, I, I need your help. How will you address this issue? You're the king. You're a man of renown and wisdom and knowledge and authority. He says a man had some guests come in, and we had one man that just had a little pet lamb for his daughter, and we had that man had hundreds of sheep. So David, the man that had the pet lamb for his daughter, that man ordered his servant to take the little pet lamb, kill it, and serve it to the guest. He said, David, what should I do? Be careful of the judgment you give out. Yeah. You may be faced with the very same judgment. Mm -hmm. He says, David says, by pounding his chest, he should be put to death. Man of God point that bony finger right into David's face and says, thou art the man. David knew exactly what he was talking about. You're on it. That little poor man that just had that little one man. His wife was all he had. David was the king that could have any wife he wanted from anywhere in the region. But he chooses to take that man for the pet money. Man of God says to David, the sword will never You said he should be killed. <coughs> but God's not going to kill you today. Mm -hmm. But you're going to pay for this fourfold. The baby died. Mm -hmm. David's son raped his daughter. 
and one of the other boys killed him. Absalom tried to kill David. And the Bible says he died being hung by his hair, chasing after his body. And you go down the list, four of David's children died a horrible death because of the sin of their dad. That's that was said before in our life and our studies at time. A lot of times, a lot of our family, people close to us, go <coughs> through difficult situations in their lives as a result of our sin. The Bible says the sin of the fathers are entered upon the third and the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It tells me that Ruby's kids and Emma's kids, and Emma's not born yet. might suffer something because of what granddaddy did. That's right. This is a baby that will be one later this month or next month. The other one's just a year and a half old. They may have a long road to go with their children because of decisions I have made. That's why God says you have to keep some short enough decisions. That's what Paul says. Here's Paul says, keep your body under subjection. David didn't bring his body under subjection. When the things start happening, you see in Psalms 51, David cries out before God. And you hear the prayer of David. And David in Psalms 51 brought his body under subjection. But it was late. Christ was paid. The horse of the cow was already out the gate. Lots of lives were destroyed because of his sin. The Bible says, as we, uh, 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 he says, bring our bodies under subjection. God says there is a reward for the people of God that brings their bodies under subjection. I know, I share that story with David. You know why? Because I want you to get the graphic lesson that if I'm going to get this reward, I have to be open and honest with myself. Amen. I have to look inside. I have to see the sin or the wrongs that in me that nobody else knows. I must be willing to fix that. Get it under control. Paul says to lay aside the weights. He says there's some things in our life, Sister Norma, that are not sin, but they may cause other folks to stumble. They may cause other people to look at the cause of Christ and says, I don't want that. So he says, lay aside the weights, those things that affect others, but have nothing to do with your spirituality or your Christianity or your Spending eternity with Christ. He says, lay them aside. He says, think more about the other people that look at your life than you're concerned about your own life. Then he says, after you've laid aside those weights that are not sins, but lay them aside because they impact other people. And they may cause them to sin, them to struggle, them to give up, them to not trust God, them to quit church. He says, lay them aside. Then he says, lay aside the sin that so easily beset us. Paul says, we know what it is. That's what Paul said in that lesson. Paul says, Deacon Jarman knows exactly the areas of his life that needs to be addressed. He says, Brother Taylor knows exactly the areas of his life that need some attention. God, Paul says, if I'm going to get this crown, I must work diligently at dealing with those areas that I know are not pleasing unto God. I want to ask a couple of questions tonight before we close. I don't want you to answer them openly, but I want you to answer the questions with the thought in mind that I know. The devil knows. God knows. That's too many people. What are the areas in your life that's stopping you from being all that you could be for the cause of Christ? The areas that this pastor don't have a clue about. Brother Taylor is not clued in on. Nobody else in this room tonight even have an inkling. You know. The devil knows. God knows that 
these areas and stop your spiritual growth. These areas, these things have stolen this possibility of a crime. Because there are areas in your life that you would not bring under subjection. Show up, they can preach up. They can sing up, they can show up. They can give up and still know and not fix the stuff in their life. Walk out the door after leading the greatest son and putting on the biggest dance and praying the loudest and longest prayer and walk right back and to continue in that very same sin. The conscience divides. That incorruptible crown, incorruptible crown, is for those who bring their bodies under subjection. We can bring our bodies under subjection if we do what I said, that verse that we quoted earlier. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Listen to me as I close tonight. True Mind Baptist Church. Every single member in this Bible study tonight, from the tail of the teacher in the room, I beseech you by the mercy of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Look into your life. Get rid of those sins that still stop in you. And you step before the altar and you say, God, ask us to areas that have slowed me down. I'm getting rid of He says, we sit, pay attention by the He says, he's a holy. God doesn't use unholy vessels. A lot of people are saying that they're used by God, but they're not being used. They have no power. They have no influence. They're not making a lasting difference. They're going through the motions. He says, present your body a living sacrifice. He says, do it while God can still use you. Do it while you can be effective in ministry. Get this thing under the blood of Christ so that you can walk on and still have opportunity to impact eternity. Sent you by the living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Don't worry about what anybody else has to say. But Brother Taylor thinks it doesn't matter. But Brother Charles thinks it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what does God think? If God's pleased with me covering and asking and for forgiveness for my sin, and he is. He says if you confess your sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins Amen. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wants us to ask. He says, he says present you by a living sacrifice holy. Accept on God. He says that's our reasonable service. We talked about that at the beginning of our study tonight. Our reasonable service in light of what Jesus Christ has done for me. It's a small matter for me to clean up my life so I can be used to him. Reasonable service. He says, well, I want to get a control of this. He says, be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world tell you how you should live. Live your life by the dictates of the Word of God. No, it's not easy. Yes, it's hard. Yes, we're going to struggle. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to fall short from time to time. But keep some short accounts with sin. And don't wallow in that sin long. And ask God to forgive us. Get some control. He said, bring your body and then keep it. It's a fight. But we can do it. 
He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. He says a change. Change your thinking. If I change my thinking, I will change my behavior. Hmm? So he says, change your thinking, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds. He says, my mind needs to be renewed if I am going to get control of the sin that has been controlling my life in the past. I need the mind of Christ. I can only receive the mind of Christ as I transform my mind. My mind is transformed as I put the word of God into me, which pushes out the world. I want to challenge us. We said there's four crowns in offer. And every single one of you can receive two, three, four, and some of you can receive five. But as next time we meet, we will continue our study now. The second coming is a time of rest. I don't know about you, but I need a little bit of rest. And I don't think I'm not talking about that in light of death. Although the last couple of days have been drying some in there before I'm Every now and again, we need a little rest. But the kind of rest that we have when Jesus comes back, it will be an eternal rest. Not an eternal rest because we're going to be laying down all day doing nothing. We are going to be working harder than we've ever worked before. We're going to be worshiping harder than we've ever worshiped before. We're going to be taking care of God's business like we've never done it before. But Sister Norma, we won't get tired. Mm -hmm. Sister Norma sees me every Monday. I think she only comes just so she can laugh. <laughs> At the end of pantry, she sees Brother Taylor beat and spit hanging over the desk. Listen to me carefully. One day, when Jesus comes, a time to rest. That's what we're going to talk about next time. We spent quite a bit of time on these crowns, and I told you why. Because the value of these crowns, they're invaluable. Sister Mary, what towards kids? Sister Jenkins, what towards kids? Sister Hawkins, get in there, get you. Dick, on son, Brother Charles, they're available to you. But the tail keep fighting. God wants to give us something that we could give back. Let's close.